Welcome. My name's Andrew, and we are here to joyfully sing God's praise, to humbly seek him in prayer, and to carefully listen to his word. Welcome to St Matthew's Church Online.
Welcome again. In this season when we can't meet together face to face, it is a blessing that we can still engage with God together through this online platform. If you're new to us, we'd love to know that you've been with us. Just let us know through the Connect card that you'll see on your screen. We're in our second week of listening to God's Word in the Old Testament Wisdom Book of Ecclesiastes. This is a sometimes brutal exploration into questions about the significance of the things that we have, the things that we do, and the things that we experience in this fleeting life. Now that brutal honesty of Ecclesiastes has had a welcome influence on my life. As I was getting ready to enter the workforce many years ago as a young engineer, it helped me assess realistically what really matters in this life that God has given us. In more recent years, it's prompted me to appreciate the beautiful moments in life, however fleeting they might be, as a gift from God to be enjoyed and to thank him for, rather than despair because I can't hold on to them. So today we join the teacher of Ecclesiastes on his quest to find what is gained under the sun in this fleeting life through our experience of pleasure. Our senior minister, Bruce, will be teaching us as we turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And in addition, before we finish today, Nathan and his family will also be leading us in celebrating the Lord's Supper. If you haven't got some bread and wine or juice with you, you might be able to find a moment to duck out to the kitchen and grab some. But don't leave now. Right now, we're going to see some young people from St Matt's enjoying some simple pleasures.
Hey, that looked like fun. Uh, what we're going to do now is come before our gracious and holy God in prayer as Bella leads us. Hi, my name is Bella and I'm a member of the Night Church congregation. Um, I'm going to be leading us in prayer, so would you join me now? Heavenly Father, we praise you for who you are. Thank you for being our loving Father who blesses us abundantly. Lord God, we praise you for giving us fresh mercy each day and showing us endless mercy on the cross through your Son. Lord, I ask that you would help us to love others as you have loved us. Would we love each other from the very depths of our hearts? Father, I pray for the people in our lives who are sometimes difficult to love. Would you fill us with your spirit so that we may be like you? For Lord, you have transformed us and given us new life. Would we live accordingly to this calling? Lord God, thank you for your mercy in restraining the effects of the coronavirus. Please give ongoing wisdom and strength to the Prime Minister Scott Morrison, the National Cabinet and their senior medical advisors as restrictions are eased. We also pray for schools as they begin to go back. Would you continue, continually protect all teachers and children as they return? Father, we pray for places around the world experiencing high rates of infection. God, would you guide the leaders of these countries to make smart decisions to help the health of all people? Father, we thank you so much that our church continues to run. We thank you that though we are not together in person, we can still worship our great God in unity. We pray for our soup kitchen team as they adapt to serving takeaway meals to those who are in need. Give them wisdom as they seek to maintain a safe environment for those who receive the food. We pray your mercy on people around us who are experiencing homelessness and uncertainty about how their basic needs for food and shelter will be met. Show us, Lord, where we can help. We also pray for the volunteers helping to teach English as a second language at St. Matt's. Thank you that many students have been able to access teaching this term through online platforms. We pray, Lord, that they will not only learn to be confident and competent in English, but come to grasp hold of the grace offered through the death of Jesus. Lord, it is such a blessing to be able to work here in Manly um, and beyond. We thank you for our mission partners, Life Anglican Church at Marsden Park. We thank you for three years of mission and ministry in there. We praise you for the people who serve the Lord wholeheartedly in different ways and who have enabled the ministry to grow through their service and generosity. We ask that you will keep our brothers and sisters faithful to you and make them effective in sharing the grace, love and truth of Jesus with people around them. And finally, Lord, as we come to hear from your word, would you speak to us, transform us, and teach us more about who you are? Would we never be full of hearing how great your name is? Lord, we love you. Amen. What does man gain from all his labour at which he toils under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Hi, my name's Sandy Bailey, and today's reading is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, and um, you'll find it uh, if you grab your Bibles and have a look, and the title is Pleasures Are Meaningless. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good, but that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. 
I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasures of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Well, a very warm welcome to you. My name is Bruce Clark, and I'm excited about opening up the Bible again today to see what it has to say to us. The 17th century thinker Blaise Pascal famously said these words about pleasure and happiness. He said, all men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whoever, whatever different means they employ, they will all tend to this end. And what he was saying is all of us deep down actually want to be happy. And whether it's the 17th century with Blaise Pascal or today in the 21st century, it's a great reality. The catch cry of our age is this. If it feels good, then just go and do it. In other words, don't just think about life, go and experience life and find pleasure. And if you find and experience pleasure by just going and doing it, then it will lead to a happy life, a fulfilled life. And I want to say to us today, it's actually one of the great lies of this age that we live in. You see, what our current culture believes is that the meaning and purpose of life is found in the exploration and the experience of pleasure. And it's this theme that I want to explore today in the message. Today, we're in the second week of our journey through the Old Testament wisdom book that's called Ecclesiastes. We started two weeks ago, the week before Mother's Day, uh, when Scott opened up chapter one. And the word Ecclesiastes is a Greek translation of the Hebrew word koaleth, which simply means the teacher. And what we've got here in Ecclesiastes is the wisdom of the teacher as he goes on a journey through life to work out what the meaning of life actually is. And we saw last week when we opened up chapter one at the very beginning that there's this sense of helplessness as he reflects on the life that he discovers. And the summary words in chapter one, verse two are these. Meaningless, meaningless says the teacher, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. And I think a natural response is, well, it's not a very cheery book, is it? <laughs> And on the surface, it may appear that way. And so you ask the question, why do we look at this kind of book that looks so depressing in COVID-19 when we're all kind of stuck inside? And I want to say to us, um, if COVID-19 has done one thing for us, it's to slow us down. And we've been slowed down in a way that's enabled us to spend more time, more time with our families, but it's also enabled us to have time to think about the deeper and more profound questions that life throws at us. And they're questions that we might ordinarily overlook or ignore. And I don't think there's another book in the Bible that takes us on a deeper journey to think through these big questions of the meaning of life. Where is meaning to be found? Where is purpose and joy to be found? And so it's incredibly helpful, I think, to go on this journey because it's actually going to help us discover what is the meaning of life, where purpose and meaning are found and what is the reason for getting out of bed every morning and going off to our work? And importantly today, where we will actually find a sense of meaning and joy and happiness. And I deeply believe all of us want to have some level of happiness in our life. And so it's a great question to ask today. And so the title of my talk is this, The Paradox of Pleasure. And I've got three things I want to go through. Firstly, the promise of pleasure. Secondly, the problem with pleasure. And thirdly, the pointer from pleasure. Let's have a look at that first one, the promise of pleasure. We're looking at chapter two of Ecclesiastes and in verse one, 
we see this part of his wisdom project explained. Verse 1, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good and that also proved to be meaningless. There's a sense of invitation of the speaker, the teacher, preaching to himself, come now. And if you were to put a kind of Australian uh, transliteration on it, you might say, come now, let's have some drinks and see if we can find the meaning of life at the pub. I think that's what he's saying here. But to understand what's going on here in chapter two with the teacher's reflection and his journey into pleasure to try and find the meaning of life, we need to go back to chapter one just to see how they chap chapters one and two connect together. Ecclesiastes 1 introduces us to the teacher and his search for the meaning of life. And the starting point of that we saw in chapter 1 verse 12 was a journey to discover through knowledge and wisdom. And you could say by understanding the meaning of life through philosophy. He wanted to explore the world under heaven and try and make sense of us. And he starts with wisdom and philosophy and study. And he says this in terms of his conclusion, chapter 1 verse 16. I said to myself, look, I've increased in wisdom more than anyone who's ruled over Jerusalem before me. In other words, I know a lot now. I've experienced much wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. In other words, I tried to make sense of what I'd learnt. But I learnt that this too was a chasing after the wind, for with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. In other words, the end of his journey philosophically in terms of acquiring lots of knowledge was that he came to a frustrating end. It was a vanity. It was a chasing after the wind. He got nowhere. There was just an emptiness and it depressed him. And let me give you a 21st century example of that with the thinking of one of the great minds of the last hundred years, the very well-known physicist Stephen Hawking. And back in 1995, he was interviewed and he was reflecting on, to use the words of Ecclesiastes, life under the sun and what he had discovered. And this is what he said. The human race is just a chemical scum on a moderate sized planet orbiting around a very average star in the outer suburb of one among a hundred billion galaxies. We are so insignificant that I cannot believe the whole universe exists for our benefit. It's a fascinating reflection, isn't it? From the man who many say was one of the greatest minds of the last hundred years, that when you sum up all he's discovered and he was a noted atheist in the sense that he said science had explained everything that we need to know. We have no need for God or theology now. And you come with this very depressing conclusion that we're just an accident, that we are the chemical scum of the universe. And I think if you hold to that belief, you go, well, life is vanity. Life is meaningless. Where do I turn to find meaning and purpose in this world if that's actually who we are? And what we discover is that the teacher in Ecclesiastes, who's come to similar conclusions, says, what I'm going to now turn my mind to is pleasure. I couldn't find anything above, beyond, so I'm going to look inside now, if I can put it this way. And it's interesting, Tim Keller helpfully points out that the teacher fascinatingly goes down the same path that Western civilization has gone in terms of the secularization of our thinking and our culture over the last hundred years. And one of the things that, if I can say, is um, so typical of Australian culture and Western culture is the way we have now excluded God from the conversation and from the sense that God is the one who provides our meaning and purpose in life. And to be secular means to reject God and faith. And where have we gone as a result of the search for meaning and purpose, well, internally within ourselves. And that's what happens if there's no one over us, if there's nothing that we believe in that makes sense of this world, if there's nothing that we live for or in fact is worth dying for, well, then you go down the route that you see in chapter two of Ecclesiastes. Let's explore pleasure then and see if within 
I can find a meaning and purpose for life. Let's look internally. And you think about the creed of Western culture today. And it's these kind of statements. If it feels good, do it. I have a right to do whatever I want to if I'm not hurting anyone else. And that's what our world now believes. Not there is a God over us whom we should give our life to, but rather there is the self that I should pursue. And that's exactly what the teacher seeks to explore. And so let me read to us from chapter 2, verse 1 to 10, and just see what he discovers on this journey. Verse 1, I said to myself, come now. I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. In other words, I've tested philosophy, didn't find anything there. Now I'm going to find and see if pleasure has any benefit. But that also proved to be meaningless. Verse 2, laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. And here's the summary, verse 10. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labour and this was the reward for all my toil. And I want you to note two things. Firstly, verse 2, it says uh, that he explored both laughter and pleasure and they're two different words in the Hebrew language. Uh, laughter tends to be used of superficial fun. Pleasure, more thoughtful fun. You could say laughter is the lowbrow pleasure. It's the going to the pub. It's having a whole bunch of drinks and being out with your mates. Pleasure, well, it's the sense of going to the opera house to be entertained, to go to the art gallery, to be wowed and stimulated and captivated. And what he's saying is whether it's lowbrow or highbrow, he said, I've actually tried it all. I've tried getting smashed, I've tried the arts, and neither of them provided any sense of fulfillment that lasted. And the second thing to note is, when he went on this journey to explore pleasure, he went the full max. <laughs> I mean, 99.9% .9 of us could not go on the journey that he went on. He was able to go to the extreme with the pleasures he could sample because of his position. There was nothing he didn't try. And so when you read through there, verse 3, there's drinking, there's partying. Verses 4 to 7, there's the whole acquisition of property and possessions. Verse 8, he basically has more money than he knows what to do with, and with that would have been more partying. Verse 9, he's got a harem, and so he had pleasure through sex. Verse 9 also talks about his accomplishments. And so you're looking at someone who, in terms of their exploration of pleasure, their ability to experience all that life offers, has effectively tried it all. He did it all, he tried it all, and then he did a little bit more. And you see, this is the promise and the lure of pleasure. Just a little bit more and then you'll be happy. Just one more trip. Just a little bit bigger boat. Just another wave another surfboard, another drink, another relationship, another conquest, you name it. It's just one more. And in the moment when you're experiencing all these things, there is a great sense of pleasure, of enjoyment. But it's meaningless. It's hevel. It's a chasing after the wind because before you know it, it's gone. And that feeling that you look forward to is so fleeting, it's so temporary. Here one moment, gone the next, a chasing after the wind. Which leads me to the second point, the problem with pleasure. It's fascinating. As a pastor, I obviously talk with lots of people. 
And over the years, I've talked with many people about the issue of pain and the problem of it, the problem of suffering, the problem of injustice. And you don't have to think a lot about those very important topics to know there's a reality to them, that they're emotionally charged, they're very difficult, particularly for people who are suffering the pain, the suffering, the injustice that life unfortunately does um, put us through on many occasions. But what I've not really had people talk to me about and come and confess is the problem of pleasure. But let me tell you, it is a big problem. Talk to anyone who admits that they are an addict and you're talking to someone who's got a problem with pleasure. And whether it's sex or drugs or alcohol, and they're just the ones that we commonly speak of, there's many more that we get addicted to. What happens is that it's all about the next fix, the next drink, the next conquest, the next whatever. To get that hit, to get that relief, to get that feeling. And the problem is the pleasure passes and what we're filled with is a sense of emptiness and despair, of guilt. And what we thought would fill us up leaves us completely empty. And that's the problem. Pleasure promises the world. Pleasure looks exciting. But when we pursue it as ultimate, as the thing that we'll find our meaning and purpose through, it can never deliver because it hasn't got the strength to carry that weight of expectation. And listen to the conclusion of the teacher in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 11. He said, yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done, and he'd done an enormous amount, and what I'd told to achieve, he said, everything was meaningless. It was hevel. It was this sense of here today, but it's gone tomorrow. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. In fact, he looks and goes, what have I got left to gain, to benefit from all that I've experienced? And he tried to find meaning and purpose through pleasure, but it amounted to nothing. It was Hivel. I don't know if you've heard of Professor Martin Seligman. He is one of the great fathers of the movement of positive psychology. And in his book, Flourish, he defines the happiest life as the one with the true sense of meaning. He concluded that the pursuit of pleasure on its own had no bearing on increasing happiness, but that the pursuit of meaning itself was the strongest factor in increasing life satisfaction. And here's a quote from the book. The meaningful life is about finding a deeper sense of fulfillment by using your strengths in the service of something larger than yourself and nourishing other words. In other words, you're not going to find it within by the pursuit of pleasure. You'll find it outside of yourself. And I would say in the knowledge and service of God and in the community and the service of those around us. And the great story of people who've become rich and in the world's eyes have had it all is that they so often give you this testimony, I've been to the top and it's empty. And here's an example of that. His name is Russell Brand, if you don't know him. He's an English comedian, actor, radio host and writer. And he's someone who's reached the top in his career and made lots of money. And he said this, I thought it would be good to be rich and famous. It would be good to have stuff. And don't we all think that it'd be good to have lots of money and to have stuff? Well, listen to what he says. It'd be good to have money and be invited to the party. That's what I thought. Well, I've been invited and I've been in. And we're having this chat in this Swish private men's club in East London. You can just hear his English accent. It's super cool, he says. There are bare brick walls. Everyone's looking double good looking. I've been inside now. I've seen the other side of the looking glass. And it ain't worth it. It ain't worth it. It doesn't feed your soul. I still feel empty inside. And that could be multiplied over and over again by those who've had it all and found it very empty. And you see, this is the problem with pleasure. 
It offers much, but it never delivers that sense of lasting, sense of purpose and meaning and happiness in our life. And there's a great difference between happiness, which lasts, and joy, which is deep, and pleasure, which is here for a moment and gone tomorrow. Pleasure by itself can never deliver the weight of expectation that we place upon it. And what's fascinating, I think, is that we think with pleasure, if we keep pursuing it, by that one more, by that bigger, by that better, that if we keep walking down the path called pleasure, finally we'll get to the end and we'll reach some kind of nirvana. But the problem is there is no end. And the problem is not that we won't reach the end of the pathway. The problem is the pathway itself. It is the wrong pathway to trying to find happiness and meaning in life. The pursuit of pleasure for ultimate meaning will only ever lead to despair and emptiness. Well, let me finish with my third point, the pointer from pleasure. Because I'm not against pleasure in and of itself. C.S. Lewis, the great English writer and philosopher, wrote these words. It was a sermon he preached in the chapel at Oxford University in the 1940s. And the sermon was called The Weight of Glory, and he was imploring people to seek their meaning and happiness and joy in knowing the glory of God. And in it, he warned people about the lure of worldliness and the pursuit of pleasure in and of itself in order to find meaning and purpose. And he said this, let me read. The books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust to them. It was not in them. It only came through them. And what came through them was longing. These things, the beauty, the memory of our own past are good images of what we really desire. But if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshippers. And listen to his conclusion, for they are not the thing in itself. In other words, pleasure is not the thing in itself. They are only the scent of a flower we've not found, the echo of a tune we've not heard, news from a country we have never yet visited. In other words, there's a longing within us that the pleasures of this world point to. The different pleasures of this world, though, are not the real thing. Rather, they are a pointer to something external to us, which is where real joy is to be found. In other words, there is joy in this world and all the individual pleasures we get to experience actually point us that there is something lasting and eternal where you will find meaning and purpose. But in the pleasures themselves, you won't. They are a pointer beyond themselves, like the scent of a flower we've not found. The echo of a tune we've not heard. News from a country we have never yet visited. You see, as a Christian, I would want to say pleasure points us forward to God to see that the individual pleasures of this world are not the thing itself. They are reminders, they are pointers, they are signs to where the true and lasting pleasure is to be found, which is with God himself. And you see... That's actually where you get to in the book of Ecclesiastes. On a number of occasions, as you read through and read ahead in the book, he will say things like this. Here is Ecclesiastes chapter 8, 15. He says, so I commend the enjoyment of life because there is nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Now, you think, how does that correlate with what we've just heard in chapter 2? Well, there is a difference. He says, then joy will accompany them in their toil all the days of the life God has given them under the sun. And the place he comes to is this. Pleasure pursued for pleasure's sake will only ever be empty. But when you realise life is a gift from God, you can actually enjoy it in the moment and realise that though it is passing, what isn't passing is our knowledge of him. And we can receive everything from his hand with gratitude and thanksgiving and enjoy life as it comes to us day by day. And that's what he says. It is the gift of God. 
And so there's nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany them in their toil all the days of their life. God has given them under the sun. And one of my favorite verses is in 1 Timothy. And it says this, godliness with contentment is great gain. And that's what we need to learn in relationship to pleasure. Because as Christians, we are not against enjoying the good gifts that God has blessed us with. We are not against pleasure. We are to enjoy pleasure. But we are to take it as a gift of God with contentment. Not hungering for more and bigger and better, but satisfied with what we have and thankful for it and enjoying it. Because the real sense of meaning and purpose and joy in this life will only be found through knowing him who has made us and who has redeemed us. And unlike the teacher in Ecclesiastes, we live on the other side of the cross of Christ. And we know that this God who has set eternity into our hearts so that we seek him has come amongst us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ reveals to us the life that is from God. And when he came, he said so many different things. Here's just two of them. John chapter 8, verse 12. I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but they will have the light of life. In other words, there is a life that comes from God. It's through Jesus. Two chapters later, he said in John chapter 10, verse 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. He then went and died on the cross for our sins. He then rose from the dead, ascended to the right hand of the Father in heaven. And he pours out his Holy Spirit into our lives as we come to him in faith and repentance. And he fills our life with joy and peace and grace and forgiveness as we believe in him. And what it means is we can actually find outside of ourselves a pleasure, a joy as we know him, as we serve him. And we can take all of the experiences of life that we get to enjoy along the way as gifts from his good hand. Friends, pleasure in and of itself will offer you the world, but the problem is it will never deliver. And what we need to see is that actually it points us forward to the God who is the giver of all good gifts. And to know the joy of being reconciled and brought back in friendship with him through his son, the Lord Jesus. The joy of having our hearts filled with his love as our sins are washed away. As we're brought into his family and made right with him. And as we get to serve him in the world and find meaning and purpose and joy in that. And if you're listening today and you don't know this, Jesus, I invite you to come to him. He says, come to me that you might have life and have it to the full, that you might have the light of life fill your heart and mind so that you know God and you know the forgiveness of your sins and the hope of eternity through all that he's done in his death and resurrection. And if that's you today, I call you to come. Come and give your life to him. Come and be forgiven of your sins. Come and receive his love and his forgiveness and start walking with him in the joy and the fellowship of the saints. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for Jesus. We thank you for all that he's done for us. May we find our pleasure in knowing him and may we accept every good gift that comes from your hand with joy and thanksgiving and gratitude. And may we live our lives walking faithfully, following you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, everyone. My name's Nathan. This is Bill and Reuben and Jackson. And this is where we've been doing church with you all these past couple of months, which has been kind of cool and also kind of weird and definitely a little sad that we don't get to see you all in the flesh. We're going to spend the next few minutes doing something really important together and that's leading us all in the Lord's Supper. Who knows what the Lord's Supper is? 
where you drink bread and wine. Mm. That's right. And Christians have been doing this, sharing a meal as a symbol for the last meal that Jesus shared with his friends before he went to the cross. And we do it to remember that Jesus died for us and also to celebrate all the things that he achieved through his death and resurrection. So his victory over our sin, his power over death, uh, the promise of forgiveness and the hope of new life with him. Before we get started, any questions? Um, What's with the bread and juice? Well, uh, when Jesus ate the last meal, he gave them bread as a way to symbolize his body and so that they might remember that he was going to give his body up to death on a cross. And the juice he passed around in a cup. Uh, And he did that to remember that in dying, God was making a promise to forgive anyone who asked him for it. And so one of the things that's good to do before we eat and drink together is to say a prayer of confession. Do you guys know what confession is? Confetti. Confetti. Is it where you've done something bad but nobody knows, then you confess? Yeah, that's right. And uh, we've all sinned and done the wrong thing when it comes to our relationship with God. And so it's, um, it's right that we say sorry to him. Uh, which is what we're going to do now. And uh, Rubes, if you'd like to lead us in that prayer of confession, the words are going to come up on the screen. And so you can actually pray these along with us uh, wherever you might be. Thanks, Rubes. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with everlasting love, but we have often gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way. For the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And the great news is that when we ask for God's forgiveness, he promises to give it to us. Yeah, that's great. Okay, everyone's going to need to get their bread and their juice ready um, because we're going to eat and drink in a moment. I'm going to read a short passage from the Bible and then I will tell you when we're ready to eat and drink. And then we're going to finish off by praying the Lord's Prayer together. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So everybody, take the bread. Brothers and sisters, eat this in remembrance that Christ gave his body for you. Feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Take the juice. Brothers and sisters, drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. We'll finish now by saying the Lord's Prayer together. This is the prayer that Jesus used to teach his disciples how to pray. The words will be on the screen and Jackson is going to lead us in it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jax. Now it's time for us to sing. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This corn is torn, this solid ground. From through the face, this drought is torn. One way of love, one dance of peace. When fear is still, when striding cease, my comforter. Once again, if you're new to us, don't forget to let us know that you've been here via the Connect card, which is about to pop up in the chat section. Also, if you've got a prayer request or a need that you'd like some help with, we'd love to know about it and we'll do what we can to help. 
Just leave some contact details there and we'll be in touch with you very soon. Uh, this week coming up on Wednesday, we've got the second round of Kids Church Online. So mums and dads and carers, keep an eye on your inbox for more details. Uh, and if you're not receiving emails from Naomi or Stu with information on our kids and youth ministries, please fill in the Connect card and we'll make sure we get that info to you that you need. Today, in God's Word, we've joined the ancient teacher of wisdom in a quest to find out what we can gain under the sun through life's pleasures. And there are many pleasures that God gives us to enjoy. But to live for those pleasures will only lead to disappointment and frustration. Those pleasures are so fleeting. But there is a deep joy and purpose to be found by knowing Jesus Christ as Saviour and serving him as Lord. So as we wrap up today, hear these words of encouragement from the Apostle Paul, who says, May the God who gives you endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.